Romans chapters 1 and 2. Using the Messianic Jewish literal translation of the New Covenant Scriptures. Why? I don't know. I'm just trying to be obedient, and I felt moved to try and do this teaching. But why this translation? Well, I recently discovered it and fell in love with it. Because I love how while reading it, studying it, I really feel like I'm there. And I truly get a better sense that this is a Jewish book. And what we're covering here was written to both Jew and Gentile, which is important. Because when reading the scriptures, we must know who the intended audience is, where it was written, when, and anything else that will help us understand it for context and right application. Now, the book of Romans starts off with one heck of an introduction. We're going to read how Paul clearly acknowledges that he is a slave of Messiah Yeshua. That's number one. And then he'll note that he's an emissary, having been separated to the good news of God. What's important to note? As a Jew, a Pharisee, Paul was highly educated in the scriptures and fully aware of the fact that in those scriptures, a Messiah is supposed to be coming, provided that a certain provided that certain requirements are met, which he lays out in the opening of his letter. Now, this is really huge because to have a Pharisee who used to punish his own people for believing in Yeshua of Nazareth is now confessing that he is a slave to him and separated to the good news of God. Essentially what this looks like is God choosing him out of a bunch of people for, for, for a specific work. And believe it or not, the same is true for you and me in that we too have been chosen and are separated to the good news of God. Notice how he uses the word separated, meaning set apart. Remember, God chose you. John 15, 16, Ephesians 1, 4, and 1 Peter 2, 9 are just a few examples that attest to this. So now that we've established that, let's begin reading chapter 1 from Paul, a slave of Messiah Yeshua, a called emissary having been separated, set apart to the good news of God, which he announced before through his prophets in the sacred scriptures. That obviously being the first five books of the Bible or the Torah, as well as the prophets and the writings, also known as the Tanakh. Concerning his son, who, according to the flesh, has come of the seed of David, who, according to the Ruach, spirit of holiness, is designed as the son of God in power by the rising again from the dead, Yeshua, the Messiah, our master, through whom we received unmerited favor and assignment as an emissary for obedience of faith among all the Goyim, Gentiles, for the sake of his name, among whom are you also, the called of Yeshua, the Messiah. What does all that even mean? Paul, again, knows that the Messiah is coming. And after examining not only the life, but the lineage of Yeshua, he concludes that this is the same person announced through the prophets in the sacred scriptures. Listen to what he says in verse 8, I thank my God through the Messiah, Yeshua. But did you catch that? Try to put yourself there as a first century Jew who is well aware of the fact that the Messiah will come. Everybody knew it and were, expe and were expecting it to happen, and then it does. Verses 20 through 25, Paul is looking out over the landscape of his time, and he sees how mankind has claimed to be wise, had not glorified God or given him thanks. They changed the glory of the immortal God into the likeness of an image of mortal things, which was evident by the pervasiveness all around him. 
And because of this willful, willful ignorance of the truth, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to uncleanness, to degrade their bodies among themselves, which is no different than what we are seeing today. When you change the truth of God into a falsehood and honor and serve the created thing instead of the creator, the end result is clear. Things get weirder and stranger because the flesh cannot be satisfied and therefore must create new ways of, new ways of satisfaction that become more extreme and outrageous to the point where what was once considered abhorrent 10, 15, even 20 years ago is now tame, subtle, and acceptable. Now that he has set the stage, he starts chapter 2 with a therefore. Therefore what? Therefore, in light of everything I just said, you are inexcusable, O oh man, every one of you who is judging the other. In other words, how dare you judge someone when you are guilty of doing the same thing? Now, Paul is writing this letter to Jewish believers in Messiah and Gentile converts from paganism while in Corinth around the year A.D. 57. He's trying to unify the body of believers, even saying as much in verses 11 through 16 with, Indeed, there is no acceptance of faces with God, for as many as have sinned without having Torah also will be destroyed without being judged by Torah, and as many have sinned in Torah will be judged through Torah. For it is not the hearers of Torah who are righteous before God, but the doers of Torah who will be declared righteous. For whom goyim, Gentiles, who do not have the Torah, naturally do the righteous things of the Torah, these goyim, Gentiles, though not having the Torah, are a Torah to themselves. These who show the action of the Torah written in their hearts with their conscience also being witness with them and their thoughts being between one another, either accusing or else defending them in the day when, according to my good news, God judges the secrets of men through Messiah Yeshua. So what is he saying? He's clearly directing this to the Jewish believers who are trying to stand on Torah as if it's something to be proud of while they're standing in judgment of Gentile believers who are new to the faith. Going as far as to say in verses 23 and 24, you who boast in the Torah, do you dishonor God through the sidestepping of the Torah? For because of you, the name of God is spoken of as evil among the Goyim, Gentiles. I have a question. Are you the reason why people want nothing to do with God? Listen to how Paul closes chapter 2. For circumcision indeed benefits you if you practice Torah. But if you are a sidestepper of Torah, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. In other words, don't be a hypocrite. Verse 26, if therefore the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the Torah, meaning the, the Gentiles, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? That's a rhetorical question. Verse 26, and the uncircumcision naturally fulfilling the Torah will judge you who though the letter of the written Torah and circumcision are a sidestepper of Torah. Verse 28, For one is not Yehudi, Jewish, who is only so outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is only outward in the flesh, meaning there's two kinds. Verse 29, But one is Yehudi, Jewish, whose circumcision is also of the heart, in the Ruach, spirit, not only in letter, for which the praise is not of men, but of God. Paul is making it clear, or at least it should be clear to his audience, that Torah observance and eighth-day circumcision doesn't matter 
if you are a sidestepper of the very thing you say benefits you. In fact, a Gentile believer who doesn't know Torah yet practices Torah will be considered more righteous because of the circumcision of their heart that causes them to obey Torah. So what's the takeaway? Don't be a hypocrite. Have your heart circumcised and follow God above all else. Because Torah can't save you. Your circumcision can't save you. Your heritage can't save you. Only Yeshua the Messiah can. Which means it's got nothing to do with you. To God be the glory. Amen.